Hello and welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's book chat. My name is Mary Alice McCarthy, and I direct the Center on Education and Labor at New America. For those of you not familiar with New America, we are a public policy think and do tank, and we are dedicated to renewing the promise of America by continuing the quest to realize our nation's highest ideals. At the Center on Education and Labor, part of, what, part of our work is to build public awareness of the critical role that worker organizations, particularly labor unions, can play in building stronger and more resilient communities. And today, we are going to hear about a very compelling example of just that, which is documented in this delightful and engaging book, One Day Stronger, How One Union Local Saved a Mill and changed an industry and what it means for American manufacturing. So for the next hour, we're gonna hear the story of the Appleton coated paper mill located in the Fox River Valley of Northeastern Wisconsin in the village of Combined Locks, which found itself on the verge of closure in 2017, but escaped the fate so common to manufacturing plants across the Midwest over the last several decades. Guiding us through this conversation will be, doc, will be Dr. Anne-Marie Slaughter, the CEO of New America and a prolific author herself who has published books on a wide range of topics from foreign policy to network theory to the challenges facing working women. Her most recent book published just last month is titled Renewal from Crisis to Transformation in Our Lives, Work and Politics, which is a title that frankly could also be used to describe the, 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 the events that take place in One Day Stronger. So I think Anne-Marie and the author's book, Tom Nelson, have a lot in common and a lot to talk about. Anne-Marie will be talking with Tom Nelson, the author of One Day Stronger, who is also the county executive of Outagamy County, Wisconsin, and a candidate for United States Senate in the 2022 Democratic primary. And she'll be talking with two other people with deep experience with the Appleton coated paper mill, including Doug Osterberg, the former CEO and a key player in keeping the plant alive, and Kevin Eldreth, a member of the United Steelworkers Local 2469 and a worker at the still operating Appleton coated paper mill, although he'll let us know that it has a new name now, but again, the still operating paper mill. And we hope to hear from you who are watching and listening today through some question and answers toward the end of the hour. So please sit back and enjoy. And with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Anne-Marie. Mary Alice, thank you. Uh, and to everyone listening, I, I encourage you uh, to check out uh, the Center for Education and Labor's website at New America. It is, it is one of the few places that puts together education and labor. Uh, and frankly, it's, it's good to have labor back in the headlines as far as I'm concerned. So Tom, um, you and I are gonna talk for a while and then I will bring in our fellow participants. But I have to start by, by just noting just how unusual the story is. You know, I've read, I've read a lot of books uh, on, you know, how manufacturing plants uh, have closed down uh, from, you know, how the Garden Club saved Youngstown, which is, is one of about how Youngstown survived, but, but only after the plants shut down. Uh, Beth Macy wrote about the collapse of the furniture industry in North Carolina. Uh, and, and in, in small towns in North Carolina and in Virginia. And uh, Amy Goldstein wrote about the decline of the auto industry. And lots of, uh, lots of people really focused on Janesville and what the impact uh, that it had on, on Janesville, Wisconsin, which is only as far as I, I know, about a hundred miles south of the town where your story takes place. Um, there are lots of other books on the same theme, but One Day Stronger has a very different account, uh, and the plant doesn't close and the jobs don't vanish. I don't think I'm giving away anything. Um, and so instead of this kind of rust belt narrative of shuttered factories and abandoned homes and, and a whole population that feels left behind, instead the plant's still operating uh, and it really the, it, you had an impact on the industry as a whole. So with that sort of framing, I wanna just start by asking you, um, you, you know, why did you write the book? Uh, and what do you hope to accomplish by telling the story? Well, thank you, Dean Slaughter, if I may, being a former student. 
and also to New America for hosting this. Um, I think it's a very important story, and that's the reason why I wrote it. And for the reasons you just gave, uh, Dean Slaughter, about how, do you mind if I call you Dean Slaughter? <laughs> <Just so you're laughs> <best friend. laughs> um, the reason why I wrote that is for the reasons that were just mentioned that this is the antithesis of what we have been experienced, what America has been experienced across the country and specifically in the upper Midwest. And so here was an example of how we turned around that narrative. And the way we did it is a lot different than, I mean, there have been more cases, more instances where this has happened, but the way that we fought this, the way that we pushed back, how there were a series of these actions um, that we included insolvency law. So there were some attorneys involved. There was, of course, the courtroom drama. There was the very smart management and labor team management from, from, from uh, Doug Osterberg, who was the CEO at the time, who had been in the industry for 35 years, putting together a business model and then labor, partnering with them to, to, um, to realize this. So that was a big reason why I wrote it, but then there's a couple of these underlying kind of subplots. And one of the biggest ones was the Foxconn controversy. And I'm sure that there's probably quite a few people listening, watching right now that were aware of this four billion, at the time, a $4 billion public uh, taxpayer outlay to Foxconn Corporation from, from, uh, from uh, Taiwan that made electronics part, the deal that was done with former governor Scott Walker. And this happened at the same time. And so the comparison contrast with how we did this pretty much on our own, we got no support from the state. Foxconn was getting all the attention, all the resources, all the money, and not just Appleton coded, but at that same time, within about a four month window, we had three other mills that were affected. Atheon, US paper converters, and uh, the Kimberly Clark facility in Winnebago County, which has its own chapter too. So all these things came together. I thought this is a really unique story. No one's really telling it, at least not telling it in the way that I think would be accurate. And it kind of fell to the wayside. And it's something that I thought about a lot. I committed about two years of my life doing interviews, about 70 interviews, doing the research on labor history and the paper industry, how this was unique. And we'll get to this how the lessons learned here, we can, you know, we can apply not just in the paper industry, but across manufacturing. And then I think the postscript to all that is now more than ever, we need to have a straw manufacturing base because by outsourcing everything around, I mean, around the world, we don't have control of our supply chain anymore. And that is a big driver of inflation, of the state of the economy, et cetera, et cetera. Great. So I'm gonna. We are gonna get to those bigger lessons, and I'll just say to to the, those everyone in the audience uh, that that uh, Tom calls me Dean Slaughter because I was the dean of the School of Public and International Affairs uh, at Princeton when he was there. In case you're wondering where the title came from, uh, so before we get to the the larger story, you were county executive, right? And so if I'm thinking about this story, I might I might expect that you know the I, the you Union took the lead, or uh, indeed that there was some collaboration uh, between management and labor to save the, the plant, although sadly that's not a story we hear enough of in the United States. But I, I don't think I would have expected a county executive. So <laughs> walk me through uh, your role. So the way that this worked is I sat down with a friend of mine who was, who was an insolvency lawyer, one, one of the top bankruptcy lawyers in the state. We just happened to have lunch the week before uh, the, uh, the receivership. And he made the point saying, look, you're the county executive. You have standing to object to the sale, which is what is allowed in Wisconsin receivership law, which is unique. And so that kind of got the ball rolling. I talked to Doug and his team I talked to John Geenan, who was from Kakana next to where I grew up in Little Shoot in Nagimi County, who at the time was the international vice president for pulp and paper. So he was basically the leader of the paper worker union for North America. 
And so a lot of it all came together. We talked a lot about this. I was really excited about it. And so I was kind of pushing and pushing. Doug had this great business model. Kevin and the steel workers, they wanted to fight back. They were not going to give up on that. And then so the three of us kind of got together. So you have local government, you have management, and you have labor. And it had to happen pretty quickly. It happened, I think, within a few days, maybe less than a week. Huh. And, and so the, just, just take us through a little bit the, the kind of connection with, the, so the bankruptcy law connection is that you have standing to object or was that part of the solution as well? That's kind of what started things. So what I did is the sale, so it went into receivership, it went to an auction. It was auctioned off to a scrap dealer in California who's going to scrap it, okay? And the sale came before Allegheny County, before one of our circuit court judges. And usually these, it's kind of pro forma. It takes 15, 20 minutes, but, you know, we packed that place. And so I objected to the sale. Um, the steel workers, it was their legal argument that really drove the train. We can talk about that later. And then there were a couple of vendors who were owed a lot of money. I mean, there was, I mean, Doug can give a number. I mean, there was millions, millions in the, in the accounts receivable, people who weren't going to get any money. And so a few of those folks objected too. So that is what started. That's the, the quote unquote courtroom drama that really initiated this, that gave a standing, me being county executive with 600 jobs um, at stake steel workers because a lot of their members were going to lose their jobs and lose a lot of back pay and vacation benefits and so forth. And of course, Doug, who was the leader of this mill, who put 35 years, 35 years of heartbeats in, into this, who was going to fight back and do that as well. So that was the, that's what got us going. If we did not have this special kind of provision in Wisconsin solvency law, this probably wouldn't, would, 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 you know, would not have happened the way it did. So that to me is so interesting in the sense of, of recognizing that the, the county, the community has standing in the legal sense, you know, to object that this isn't just mm -hmm. a private uh, transaction and that there's still value in the going concern, right? Mm -hmm. That the, the minute it turns into scrap, I mean, there'll be value in the scrap, but it's far less than the value of what is still there, but, but needs to be reorganized or need, needs a, some kind of, of plan uh, to save it. And that the county can see that and the folk and the community can see that and the, obviously the workers uh, and management, but the, the minute you sell it, you know, to somebody outside the state, they can, all they can see is is what it can be reduced to. It's it's a right. really interesting example of, of of sort of how when we talk about um, you know stakeholder capitalism or multi you know all the different stakeholders in a business who normally don't get get recognized. Um, talk a little bit about. Uh, so, some of those lessons. We're gonna we're gonna talk more about what actually happened when we bring in Doug and Kevin. But talk a little bit about what what you you see the lessons are, and specifically what needs to change so that this is not just a story we hear uh, about Appleton coded. Well, what really drove this is PNC Bank, which held the note. They were the ones. It wasn't. I mean, technically this wasn't the case, but they effectively called the note that put Appleton Coded in a position where the only choice they had was to go into receivership. So if you're talking about public policy and what we can change in a legal sense, we need to adapt um, insolvency law in general, whether it's bankruptcy or receivership, to mirror that of the European model where it takes community effects. Right now, the only thing that matters is that the bank gets paid because you're not gonna get the full value. They're at the front of the line, they get the money, maybe the workers get something, maybe local business, usually that's not the case. So we need to have a fundamental change in bankruptcy and insolvency law in general that takes into community effects. What does this mean for the local economy? How do we at least make the workers whole? If they lose their jobs, is their training, is there similar work? How is that gonna contribute? Education, what type of facilities, what type of institutions do we have? 
I mean, the Center for Education and Labor, which is helping sponsor this, that's what it is. And I think this is a good example that falls into their mission statement. It's not just labor, but it's education, how you train the workforce, whether it's before, hopefully, or on the back end, God forbid something like this happens. So I think the big lesson to take from this, from a public policy standpoint, is that we have to change American bankruptcy and insolvency law in general. And this is also, I mean, this is also um, a reason why Senator Warren um, basically went from a Republican by her admission to, to a Democrat because she saw how punitive bankruptcy law is. And I haven't looked exactly what the plans for policies right now are, but I think what would be right at the alley is to change that. And you mentioned the U.S. Senate um, having this experience. This is something that I definitely would definitely get involved, in, especially at a national level. Hmm. And so bankruptcy law, anything else that needs to change in terms of public policy? I think that really is the big one. I, I would say on the public policy, and that was the main issue. But one of the things we struggled with before we had the idea of objecting to the sale was the culture and how a lot of people in the community were resigned to this faith that we're just losing paper mills. Even here in the paper valley, um, a lot of people said that's a dinosaur, we need to do something completely different. This is another example, we can't put people in manufacturing and so forth. And so on top of that, plus the fact that there were all these setbacks that labor dealt with after Act 10, which effectively eliminated public sector unions, implementation of so-called right to work, rollback of prevailing wage, unions had were just had this huge black eye. They were taken left and right. And so they felt beaten down. They don't want to have one more loss. The community, so that labor losses, losing other paper plants, we really had to buck people up. Like, hey, we can do this. Let's get going. So how we not get that point in the first place is we need to make public investments, whether it's basic science research with nanotechnology, which um, Dom Tar, another paper company, has been experimenting in. Um, University mm -hmm. of Maine is uh, funding some of that. We don't have the type of research and development into this in industry. And let's be honest, we don't have a lot of you know, public finance investment in manufacturing in, in general. So another aspect of public policy, we're one of the only countries that does not have a national industrial strategy, mm -hmm. which at the time, West Germany, Japan, South Korea had in the late 1970s and 1980s. We, you know, they packaged together trade policy, research and development, identifying national security commodities that they were going to support. We didn't do that. And so we suffered manufacturing really got hit hard in, in the 1980s, the 1990s. Here in the paper industry, we kind of peaked around 2000 and we've been taking on the chin ever since. So you lose jobs in the upper Midwest, you lose jobs, whether it's in Janesville with the auto plant down there, um, whether it was uh, the glass factory, um, anchor glass, the losses yep. that they suffered. But now we all are. We all are because I think it is arguably one of the main drivers of inflation and the woes that we are dealing with as a country, this, this, this uh, disrupted supply chain. So, and it's interesting because really President Biden's uh, uh, kind of investment bill, uh, research and investment bill this summer is a, 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 a big step toward an industrial policy. It's not yeah. all the way there, but it is saying, look, we are not going to be able to compete uh, with other nations unless we also have a strategy and, and really have that investment. And even, you know, industry protection on, on in very specific cases to help, help grow things. So Doug, I wanna bring you in at this point uh, and I, I want, us to, want the two of you still um, to tell, tell a little more of the story and, and then I, I, I will we'll turn to Kevin as well. But so Doug, so we, first of all, um, just talk about how you felt during this process and when Tom came, when you, when you sort of realized there was another way to go because management doesn't always respond the way you responded. Well, I think we we felt like we had that uh, strategy in place before the receivership started. Um, 
when I took over in 2013, we were really struggling. The, the uh, coated free sheet industry was struggling. Uh, some competitive mills had already closed. In fact, one of them adjacent to us in Kimberly, just a mile or two away. Um, and we all kind of knew that we had to do something different. I spent, uh, I don't know, 15 or 20 years in various technical and uh, directing research and development and field tech service had a lot of connection with customers and, you know, it was in a position where I had a lot of insight into what opportunities might exist. We, we tried and tried to make various kinds of specialty products that would take us away from the, the bread and butter commodity stuff that was in decline and always uh, on the edge of profitability at, at best. So when, um, when, when things really got tough and pulp prices were climbing, we were purchasing all of our pulp and our competitors weren't. So that was a kind of an Achilles heel that we had to deal with. Um, we looked at uh, bringing in some pulping equipment, uh, doing our own pulping with, with waste paper and making recycled fiber, making grades with that. And as we looked further and further into it, it became very apparent that the opportunity was in packaging grades. Um, the uh, the the uh, home purchase uh, you know um, effects from Amazon and others uh, were were really just getting you know some substance at that point, and it was it was clear that that was going to take off, um, and it has, and it continues to, um, and fortunately we had paper machines that were very capable of making some of these grades. Um, they should so have just had. I want to add more specifically the traditional product. So Appleton coated. I'm not sure everybody knows what coated <laughs> refers to. The, what the traditional product products were what, and then you went to packaging grade, meaning basically boxes. Is that right? Yeah, that's that's right. Um, our traditional grades were um, what you would see in sales brochures, <clears throat> promotional ah, materials. Shiny. Back in the day when there were annual reports, that type of paper. <laughs> a lot of it, you know, heavily coated with very uh, rich printed images on them. Um, so a, a lot of really good equipment and uh, up, up to date. And uh, as that market declined, we started making some more traditional uncoated products, uh, office papers, you know, the, the kind of stuff you put through your copy machine. <clears throat> you can't find anything more commodity and yeah. more competitive. Um, so just trying to fill machines. But you know, when, when we had all the machines running, we were profitable. Um, when I took over, we were losing eight figures, if you can believe that. Um, we got our head above water the next year. We, we actually made pretty good money in 2016. And then pulp markets uh, tightened up and we were really pinched in 2017. <clears throat> and we had a couple of unusual clauses in our our uh, deal with PNC Bank um, that basically, uh, because of the cyclicality of the business, put us in, in, uh, in a position where they could call it. And as Tom said, they couldn't technically force us to, to uh, file bankruptcy, but when they take all your cash away and you can't pay your people, or can't pay your vendors, can't pay the power bill, you really don't have much choice. Um, we, we had a couple of other issues that <clears throat> encouraged us to go in that direction, basically to free uh, up a power plant uh, that we owned but couldn't use to produce our own power with. Um, Tom elaborated on that in the book a little bit. Uh, you know, the, the decision to do it, I think, was, was the right decision. We spent quite a bit of time, even before the receivership, trying to line up potential owners couldn't get them to the finish line, but uh, expected that they would come to an auction and do so, and they yeah. didn't. So here, here we are <clears throat> a day after the, uh, two after the, uh, the auction, and Tom's working his angles and I'm working mine. And uh, you know, at, at some point in there, we, we all came together and decided we've got to make this happen. So, so you had a, 
a model of profitability in your mind. You had made good money. You had a you had a view of how the plant could make good money. Is that right? Well, and yes, and th- and things as they tightened up in 2017, mid year by mid year, we were struggling to keep the machines all running. The, the, there just was not business in the traditional grades to keep the machines full. And it, it, it's such a tight and heavily capitalized business that if you slip just a few percent, things go south really fast. So we had already begun running trials really over a couple of year period, um, but quite intensely those last couple of months to make some of these packaging grades, uh, basically starting with corrugating medium and eventually going to liner board. Um, we had orders in hand that would have filled the machines uh, and we just were not allowed to, to move ahead with it. So at what point did you think it's time to reach out to the union? Because I have to say this to me is, is part of this story is a public policy story and part of the story is how communities pull together and part of the story is how CEOs have to think. And this is not what I, what I think Many, many CEOs would not make that move. So, so talk about how that came, came about or when, when you thought about it or what. Um, I, don't re- I, don't, I, I don't, I honestly don't remember ever reaching out. Um, we had a pretty strong relationship. And from the time I took over running the company, uh, I had a pretty much open door policy and I shared as much as I, I could share. Uh, we had monthly update meetings. I, I met with whoever from the company wanted to come and talk and ask any question they wanted to. And um, obviously, there are a few things that, because of confidentiality agreements and so on, couldn't be shared. But uh, I think uh, the union understood our strategy and what we were trying to do. They understood. Stand. We, even though we were able to buy some of the pulping equipment we wanted to uh, to install, we we couldn't get a loan. Couldn't get ahead far enough to actually install it. Um, so we were you know, collectively working in that direction the whole time. And so you thought of this as you and the union had a common interest. You didn't see them as an adversary. I don't believe I ever have. Um, I, I appreciate that maybe some CEOs might, but uh, as Tom said, I spent, really I spent in the end, about 39 and a half years at that facility. Uh, I, I pretty well knew almost everyone, um, most of them on a first name basis. And I think we all had a sense of trust in each other and everybody's trying to do their job and, and pull their weight. Um, it's unfortunate that not every business is like that and not every leader is like that. Uh, Especially, you know, you asked earlier one of, of Tom, you know, what what could government do to help this, or, or what could be changed? I was going to ask you that too. So I, I think something I would add to that conversation is there's been quite a shift in in business ownership, especially big business ownership in the last twelve or so fifteen years. Um, really, since the the recession of 20, 2008, 2009 and the the subsequent um, uh, restrictions, I'll say, uh, the Sarbanes-Oxley and some of those kind of things have just forced so much regulation on big companies and the, the cost involved with complying with it has taken public ownership away. And th- there's something like half as many publicly uh, traded companies now as there were before that. And instead it's shifted toward private equity. Right. And private equity is generally all about the bottom line. So you see a lot of CEOs who didn't grow up on the, on the, on the machine floor, um, don't really understand the products and the, and the processes and who the customers are, who the suppliers are. Um, it's all about numbers. And when they look at labor, they look at cost. They don't look at it, they don't see an asset and someone that can help them um, take it on. It's, it's a very different view, if you will, than the, than the traditional uh, small business owner who grows his business, knows everybody who's working for him and, 
it uh, it evolves into a and grows into a big corporation. And, uh, so I, I yes, as I was thinking about it, the the kind of community connection is so much of what's what's been lost. Where where the CEO doesn't often doesn't have a connection before he or she is is brought in, but you must have still had to negotiate with the unions. I'm interested because the, you know, the oh, European model is much more collaborative, but obviously, you know, you had, <laughs> there is still a difference once you move into the CEO suite. Um, so when, you, yeah. Yeah, and remember we were owned by a, by a, a French conglomerate actually. And, uh, you know, I was somewhat remotely aware of a lot of the, the issues that they dealt with in Europe. And they had a couple in South America too, a couple of mills. Um, they had a lot of labor issues, um, way more than we did. Uh, and and I, I'm not sure how that evolved. Uh, but of course, we, we had to negotiate things and we didn't always see eye to eye on everything. And of course, they always are asking for more than you can afford to give and, and all. But uh, you know, my, my view is it's an investment. If you uh, would, well, well our, our contract had opportunities to share our earnings. And in 2016, we were able to do that. Um, we couldn't have felt better about things than to be able to do that. It meant we were doing well. That means they should do well. Um, that is a, uh, yes, that's a different way of looking at it. And also the idea that, you know, you can be on other sides, uh, opposite sides of the bargaining table. And yes, you, you know, you can't give them, neither side gets fully what they want, but it doesn't mean that you're not in it, in it together. Kevin, that's a maybe a good moment to to bring you in, and I know you were not working uh, at Appleton Coded when all this happened, uh, so I'm not going to ask you to comment um, on the on the specifics. But it would be great if you could just talk a little bit about what it's like to be there now and to be a member of the union, and maybe respond to some of what Doug said from the perspective not of someone who was there then, but more broadly how you you see union management relations. Sure, absolutely. And uh, I just want to make one clarifying point. Our uh, local number is 2144. Uh, uh, I think there was a different number at the beginning. So I just wanted to say that. But um, <laughs> yeah, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't there um, during the uh, plant closure and during what happened with uh, Tom getting involved. Um, but actually, one of my very closest friends was. Um, and uh, it was, it was uh, really tumultuous uh, in the community uh, for that family. Um, and, uh, so the impact, uh, Tom's work and, uh, uh, Doug's work and the union's work, uh, we felt it, you know, uh, indirectly, uh, in our family at the time. So, um, it, it does have that, that impact, um, when these things happen. Um, yeah, I, uh, looking at, um, where we're at today, uh, I joined, uh, the, the mill, uh, on the recommendation of my friend who uh, was there when all of this happened. Um, what you have now, and Doug may very well be aware of this, but uh, a lot of the people that were called back when the mill opened up, uh, a lot of people came back. Uh, they wanted to come back because this was their livelihood. And um, it's not a term uh, that would really be taken lightly by them. Uh, we, we use that term a lot, um, but to them, it's all they've known is running these paper machines uh, it's, they've worked with the same partners for 20 years. Um, it really is their family away from home. So, uh, and I see that coming in and, uh, you know, that that's an attractive aspect of uh, working in that atmosphere is uh, you do have people you can rely on, good workers, um, and then of course, you know, a union contract keeping things fair, um, at least trying to you know, negotiate fairness uh, across uh, from our side of the table. So. Um, yeah, the plan still stands and uh, new people like me are coming in um, to, uh, to join and uh, be a part of that growing industry. As we know with COVID, uh, a lot of things have been uh, shipped now, right? We're not, uh, you know, seeing as much uh, in-person shopping. It's a really transition into that uh, packaging uh, being very, very valuable for uh, major, major players uh, in the market. So it's great. And does it matter, just thinking about it in terms of supply chains and COVID and, and sort of recognizing that it's not such a great idea to depend on things being shipped from halfway around the world, does it 
matter in terms of if you're getting your boxes to Walmart or Amazon or whoever it is who's shipping uh, that, that it's in Wisconsin? Absolutely. Um, well, paper is, is uh, really a, a massive part of the culture in Wisconsin. Um, has been long before I was here, but uh, it, it's it's hugely impactful because uh, that uh, those wages that are paid to us uh, helps our microeconomy right here uh, in in the Fox Valley where we are. So that's a huge uh, huge impact to our community and our small businesses that are struggling to survive here. You know, restaurants closing, things like that. We're able to to take our earnings and go participate in the community. Uh, which is really powerful. Oh, and what about union recruiting? Or is it is that everybody unionized in the plan or partly? Sadly, no. Um, it is an open shop now, um, thanks to the right to work uh, bill. Um, there were some people that uh, you know, didn't like how things played out and didn't want to pay dues any longer. And uh, thanks to that bill, that's perfectly fine. So. Uh, yeah, it is open shop. We're still about, I want to say, 70% or so uh, oh, well, unionized. So uh, we're well above our threshold to keep our standing. But um, yeah, we'd like to see more involvement. And so let me ask you a broader question just, and again, Doug, you can comment on, on this as well, or, or uh, Tom, but unions aren't always invited to the table when uh, to negotiate uh, issues around with banks or private equity on or really the future of a company, right? A lot of people would say, look, the union's job is to negotiate wages and fair working conditions, and that's it, not the future of the company. How do you think about that? Um, I strongly disagree, um, of course, <laughs> but uh, uh, Unions uh, should absolutely be there because uh, our our wages, all those things that we negotiate, they're they're contractual, and if something threatens that contract, um, you know, Doug Doug does have a very different view of of trying to work with uh, the unions. Uh, the union are local. Um, you know, there's a lot of examples we're seeing today where that's not the case. You know, John Deere and so forth. But uh, those things do affect the contract and. Uh, Unions have a lot of resources, tons of resources. We have organizing power. Uh, we have attorneys as well uh, that can look at things from a different angle. Um, uh, we have uh, media platforms as well that we can use, um, which we're seeing with the John Deere workers. There's a lot of attention now uh, around that. So um, that power can be uh, beneficial for both sides. Um, so I do think that unions should be at those tables and say, hey, how can we help? Uh, without necessarily sacrificing everything that on, on our side, maybe we take a wage cut or something like that. Maybe we can use a different avenue uh, to, to help bring some attention around this and find a better solution rather than just take it from the workers. Yeah. Again, the, the, as you talk about it, there's that strong sense of common value, right? If the plant goes under, management loses, the workers lose, everybody loses, the community loses. So the sense of actually we're on the same side when it comes to keeping it going that, you know, it's like the size of the pie, then you can argue about who gets what, but you got to keep the pie uh, there. Let me open it to all of you. Uh, and Tom, maybe I'll go back to you to, um, to start. I mean, so, so a big part of this is a very far-sighted or community-minded or right-minded CEO, <laughs> depending on you want to, want to think about it, um, but also a union uh, that, that he could work with. Um, how do you think about this in terms of the role of labor more broadly? I mean, unions, of course, have been on a steady decline, although we are, we may be at an inflection point, uh, just given, you know, labor shortages. But talk about how you see this in terms of uh, American labor more generally. Well, and, and that's, really, that's really the thrust of this book, which is... You know, there is in the Constitution, there is the freedom of association, which, of course, undergirds the labor movement for why you can associate and uh, organize. And so what is preventing that from happening is that these anti-union forces have the momentum and they've been pushing back. So you've got ever since Taft-Hartley, which is the birth of right to work, we have these open shops. That goes back to 1947. 
And about that time is when American, when union, uh, uh, the union profile peaked at around 33 or 34%. Mm -hmm. So it's no coincidence that when you had that peak, somewhere between the 50s and 60s was the beginning of where manufacturing declined and where we saw it and where we felt it in the 1970s. So part of the reason why labor and management has this antagonistic, antagoni you know, antagonizing is because of law and is because of the fights in the legislature and so forth. So that is all the more reason why there is a pro-labor agenda. We're talking about the PRO Act, which I think is important because that is going to make it easier for workers across industry to be able to organize. That's very important. Doing something about Taft-Hartley, getting rid of that understanding, the origins of the problems we have in labor, go back to 1947 and Taft-Hartley. Just and say a little more what, what Taft-Hartley provided for about, some folks. So, yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. So, so, uh, so, so Taft-Hartley um, was, you know, was a response to a lot of the strikes and that were happening in the 1940s. And so it was trying to push things the other way. So there was an incredible amount of momentum coming out of World War II and Taft-Hartley pushed back against that. So part of that was the right to work. And so you had shops in, in, in states that elected to be a right to work. So legislatures passed that. And so the burden was on the workers to organize and to pay their dues and to make sure that everyone who was there that was involved. So it really put the onus on labor, this energy on, you know, to be on, to be on defense, to have to organize. And so it was one more obstacle. And then there was the issue with the secondary strikes and so forth. But that really was that piece of public policy, but then more, moreover, the kind of momentum that put labor on the defense. The point right now, it's taken all the way to, you know, to 2021, you know, 90 years after the Wagner Act that established the National Labor Rate, uh, Relations Board, established the right to collectively bargain. 80, 90 years later, we're finally trying to add to that to try to change things, to make things easier to organize. The biggest thing is to be, um, is to be acknowledged by management that there is a labor union and then be able to come to the table and collectively bargain. So Doug, do you see, do you see that model, again, the sort of less adversarial model, the more, uh, if, if not if collaborative at times, if I think about the European model, but at least sort of, sort of accepted that everybody is going to, to work things out. Do you see that taking hold, the possibility of it taking hold? Well, I certainly see the possibility. I think every company and every, every workforce, uh, you know, has its own issues. Um, my my personal feeling is that uh, we've all got to be rowing in the same direction, and if we don't, we as management don't share uh, what our need is and understand what the what the labor uh, forces is, uh, that's difficult to do. So a lot of it is communication and uh, uh, being maybe a little bit more open and transparent about uh, you know how things are and where things are going. Um, the unions themselves need to do some policing. Uh, I, I think a lot of the negativity toward um, unions comes from uh, ma management that perhaps doesn't understand what their role is and sees nothing but cost and uh, they, they see uh, job restrictions where this person can't help that person because quote it's not his job and so on uh, s simple little things that the rank and file members don't want either and uh, you know when you get past all that kind of stuff there's no reason you shouldn't be working together and, and uh, moving in the same direction Kevin you want to add your view 
Sure. Um, you know, I think that a, a lot of companies have a very similar models financially where there's this continual quarterly growth, if you will, or annual growth. Um, workers don't get that. Workers don't get that, uh, that level of, uh, you know, 30% uh, increase next year to provide for your family. But, uh, uh, you know, so I think there's, there's a, a dissociation with, um, uh, what, what's important to the company is also important to the workers. And uh, those companies' profits are built on the workers' backs. Um, they're, you know, we're running the machines, we're shipping uh, the product and so forth. So um, I think if, um, you know, wages uh, stop being so stagnant, uh, you know, we've seen uh, really stagnant wages over decades. And, uh, but we've seen, you know, CEO, uh, valuations go up hundreds of percent. Um, there's that, that dissociation does affect the economy. Uh, it affects worker morale. Um, and one thing I do want to say, um, we have seen a huge decline in unions um, across the nation. That's definitely a big problem. Um, but steel workers have found a solution to that. And uh, it's a lot of uh, combining forces and coming together uh, under the steelworkers. If you Google United Steelworkers, you're going to see a very, very, very long list of trades uh, that are actually inside of steelworkers from paper to glass, rubber, and so forth. So uh, we're coming together to be stronger um, and hopefully, uh, you know, be able to, to collaborate better with, with these companies and find common ground. Hmm. And again, the, the, the I, so I guess what, I, as I'm hearing you in, in the book I just published, I wrote about the tradition of rugged individualism, which actually comes from Herbert Hoover, who gave a speech in 1921 when he was running for uh, what he was before um, he ran for president. But it was it was sort of a counter to European socialism. It was, you know, these Europeans have these socialist ideas. Uh, and, you know, we Americans are rugged individualists. And yet when you actually tell, a, look at a lot of the stories of part of what I think are some of our, our greatest accomplishments, you actually see traditions of solidarity just as much as you do individualism. It's not either or, right? there's both. And as I'm hearing you, I'm thinking, you know, solidarity is not a word often and that, that Americans use to describe themselves. It is a word that Europeans often use. And yet, you know, the sense of we're all in it together, that's, what, that's really what that, that means. So we have a comment from the, uh, uh, question from the audience. So I will we'll, uh, turn it over. Well, I'll read the question uh, and then we can continue the discuss discussion. So Steve Crawford says, um, don't innovations in paper products require new workforce skills and if so, how did the firm and union, uh, maybe jointly, uh, reskill workers? Uh, yes, no, perhaps. Yes, perhaps. <laughs> I, I, I would say yes, perhaps. I mean, the uh, the products that we moved to, in many ways, were simpler to make than what we had made before. That required coatings added to them and further converting and so on. Um, New skills on the front end, um, uh, processing waste paper, handling it, um, much more challenging than what we had had previously, um, but not rocket science. I mean, it's pretty straightforward and uh, our, our folks adapted very well to it. Tom or Kevin, do you want to add anything? Go ahead, Kevin. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, slightly, uh, there's, there's a lot of carryover from what I understand. Um, you know, we, we moved from, you know, simple terms, white paper to brown paper, you know, really. So, um, it, it, there wasn't a, from what I understand, a, a, lot, a lot of those machines, um, so we, we actually use less machines now, uh, than we did, um, in the Appleton coded days from what I understand uh, the coder, for example, it does not run. Um, we, we just don't need it. But the point being that to the extent you did need to, to uh, adopt new skills, it was, it was perfectly doable. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Um, 
I think what's so, important to take in consideration please. here is how the paper industry is unique. Uh, paper is the most capital intensive of any manufacturing um, in industry. It's like, you know, as far as a cost structure, it's about 80 or 85%. And so that's one of the reasons why labor has been so successful and how they've been able to organize because the cost structure is relatively smaller. So the real money makes sure that you have a really well functioning paper machine and then you don't have as many workers um, relative to the overall budget. So as long as you have folks here that are well-trained and well-equipped, they can do it. So you have the, com you have the combination of having a strong union culture here, but then you also have the intrinsic knowledge base because you also have you know, dads and sons and nephews. So it really becomes, as Kevin talks about, a way of life. It's a part of the community. And the way that a machine is built up, you have people who are in um, the wood yard, you have the broke hustler who runs around the paper machine, you know, broken you know, pieces that are falling off. You have the third hand, the second hand, and then you have all the way up to machine tender. So it gets more and more tech technical and more and more difficult. But that progression makes a lot of sense because it's perfect on the job training. But the yeah. closer you get to machine tender, the less intensive it is. You have someone who's been there for 30, 35 years, you know, you know buys a little bit different than a 20, 25 year old. So it really is a fascinating industry of how you can bring folks in the front, train them, and make it a career. And every five or 10 years, you are making this progression. And so the way that the industry is, you know, just how elegant, how that is set up, the different job classes, makes it the perfect in industry to have a strong union culture, to have good family supporting jobs, generational jobs that link a community together because of all the people that are working there. So that's interesting because a lot of the, the newer manufacturing will be closer to that, right? Capital intensive mm -hmm. with, uh, in various ways, it could, it could be 3D printing, but, but the model is higher tech, uh, mm -hmm. and but, but still then the uh, labor essential to make sure that things are operating and, and uh, so that, that's, it, that's promising that that's the capital structure. So there, I've got another question that says, uh, Congress is uh, trying anyway to hammer out a reconciliation bill right now that includes a lot of investments, as we know, that could support the manufacturing se uh, sector, unions and workers. And I will say workers also in terms of paid family leave and child care, all as far as I'm concerned, those are economic policies, not just uh, family policies. <laughs> they make it possible for people to work and have a family. Uh, but it says, if you could give them one piece of advice based mm. on your experience with Appleton Coded, what question. would it be? That's a great question. Doug, Kevin, you want to take a stab at that first? Well, my, my first reaction is uh, there's been an awful lot of money coming out of Washington that's just being printed and thrown out. Um, Tom mentioned earlier uh, the need for research and development and um, addressing these issues before the, uh, the fateful day when the, the company has to file or, or the mill shuts down. Um, we, we need more foresight and recognition that um, you can't turn a, a mill like this around overnight. It takes years um, to, to be working toward, you know, new, new solutions. And, you know, in our case, I, I look back in the time I was there, we were making telephone directory when I started. And then there were these great years of carbonless uh, copy paper and thermal papers and then coded uh, printing papers. Um, and it's about every 20 years. Uh, you've got to be looking ahead. And, you know, here we are making brown paper today. What are we going to be doing 20 years from now? I think it's very hard to try to say what is the one thing. You know, you have the labor side and then you have the capital side. And I think the paper industry is emblematic of that tension 
we only have so many resources, where do you do it? You point to health security, family med medical leave, healthcare, childcare, to make life for the worker um, as, you know, as, you know, as easy as possible, taking care of these things that should have been taken care of decades and decades ago. But then there's also the capital that goes into it. And I think with I think with paper, you can see that if you have a strong union culture, you can have it both ways. You can have a strong workforce with all these elements, because, you know, where I grew up and I mentioned about how I was living, the you know, I was living in the American dream because it didn't matter high school education, tech college or my dad having his demon because his um, his uh, doctor ministry being a pastor, it didn't matter. We had access to good schools, good hospitals. So it's really hard to make a decision one way or another. But I think what's fundamentally important when it comes specific to the paper industry is we need to have a national industrial strategy. This country has got to get smart and realize what, what European countries, what Japan did decades ago, that we need to say, this is a national security commodity, you know, whether it's microchips, um, you know, things like that, basic things, and that we need to make sure that it's a stable industry, which means you're supporting the industry, but you're also supporting the workers and by extension, supporting and growing communities like Combined Locks and the rest of the communities in, in Adegami County and around the country. Kevin, do you have a one thing or two things that you would you would advise? Yeah, it's hard to, to narrow it down to one or two, but uh, you know, one thing I if I could just say something to them rather than a piece of advice is, you know, we we are assets. Um, we we are the community. The workers are the nation. This isn't uh, the economy. And, and we can look at all the data in the world, but at the end of the day, it's workers trying to come home to their families safely with a good livable wage um, that doesn't have to rely on social programs just to survive. Um, infrastructure, uh, an investment in infrastructure is a direct investment into the economy and strengthening our, all of our local economies in the macro economy that we all live inside of. Um, so, that that investment uh, is is key right now. I think uh, you know if we're looking at um, you know the last twenty years, growing up as a millennial, we've seen crises after crises, from terror attacks to recessions to now a global pandemic. Um, we need an investment in the workers and strengthen and build up that that uh, morale again in our middle class, uh, and that that is what can help us. I believe. Well, that sounds to me like a perfect note on which to end. The title of the book, after all, is One Day Stronger. Uh, and that's, that's, that is the message of this book, that, that by the, all three working together, uh, management and labor and the county, the, community, the representative of the community, uh, that everybody is stronger, that they're really, they, it doesn't have to be a us, them, you know, adversarial approach, even if you have different interests, you're going to have different interests in some cases, but you have a common interest uh, in seeing both the, the company thrive and the community thrive, which is a, a sentiment I think we definitely need much more of in the country. But the point is, we will all be stronger as a result. So I strongly, I strongly, I highly recommend the book. Uh, and really, I'm grateful to all of you for telling a positive story, uh, even as you point out the, the difficulties of getting us there uh, beyond Appleton Coded. But you got there, and other, other companies can. Thanks so much, and thanks to the audience. <laughs>